Why are we so blurry though? See? I'm gonna turn off the video. Okay, sure. Nobody else has got their video on. Is your trick? Turn it off, yeah. See, stop my video. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Elliot Porter. Uh, hopefully, you can see me on the video, uh, and that you can you can see the slides for the presentation up on the screen. I really appreciate everyone who is uh, taking the time tonight um, to to learn a bit a little bit more about the recommendations that we're making as a part of the Long Tom Ecosystem Restoration Study. I want to stress that at this point, it's a it's a tentative recommendation. Um, so we are in the public comment period. Uh, it started on May 25th and it's gonna last until June 30th. Um, it is really important uh, that if you have feedback for us, that you provide it to us. And, and at the end of this presentation, we'll have a number of ways that you can reach out to the core team. Um, and, and what we're really interested in um, is you know, have we missed anything in our analysis um, with our recommendation? Uh, is there anything that you have concerns about or anything that worries worries you about the implementation of this plan? Um, and, you know, additionally, just understanding kind of where the community is coming from in terms of their preferences. So we're pretty late in the study process. Um, we had a scoping meeting about 16 months ago, and, and that was kind of really at the early stages where we, we got some initial feedback in terms of the, the things that the, the community was hoping to see come out of this study. And, and so hopefully we've been able to address some of those things. Um, this is an opportunity for us to provide um, an overview of some, of some of the work that we've done some of the things that have informed our decision and to provide a description of what we're recommending uh, for implementation at the Monroe drop structure. Um, and so the, the plan for this evening really is, is a relatively short presentation, so about 30 minutes or less, um, and we have two hours scheduled, and, and that's to ensure that we can address any questions or comments that you might have. Um, so you can provide them to us now verbally, um, you'll be able to email them to us. You'll be able to drop them off at, at City Hall, um, and they will consolidate and send those forward to us. Um, so there's lots of ways to reach out to us, and we really encourage you to do so uh, if you have information that you'd like to provide. Um, so with that being said, uh, we're going to move over into introductions, and uh, we'll start with the City of Monroe. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Appreciate that. Um, and good evening and welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is John Gudanis and uh, I'm on the Monroe City Planning Commission and also chair uh, a, a, a committee that was put together to help advise the Monroe City Council on this project um, that started last year. And a quick note, our city administrators, uh, Steve Martinico and Mayor Dan Sheets are hoping to join us tonight. but. Um, they're very busy with the city council trying to finalize next year's city budget, and we wish them well on that endeavor. Um, but they will definitely be checking in, in later. Um, I'm going to try to spend a little bit about from the city perspective of, on this, um, this study, but I'd like to start off by really thanking the entire project team at the Army Corps. Um, invested an incredible amount of work on the study to date, and we appreciate it. And with the completion of the study, hopefully later this summer, that's really a major milestone in this project, and uh, we appreciate that. I want to do two other quick thank yous. Um, the Confederate Tribes of the Sluts Indians are a co-sponsor on this study, and their support has been really important. And we've really enjoyed the expertise, insights, and support uh, that were provided by the team there. Um, Andrea and Stan have been critical to um, keeping the project moving forward, and thanks to them. And a big thanks to the Longtown Watershed Council. Um, they are critical partners from the beginning, 
um, and they have provided unlimited expertise and logistics and, and community outreach support um, and doing the hard work of securing additional funding that makes this project possible. So, so thanks to all those folks. Um, so the feasibility study got underway 2015, 2016, and it started out with a number of uh, um, community meetings here in Monroe. Those meetings were to discuss um, kind of interest, well, first, what was an 1135 study, and then interest and value and concerns over possible modifying the drop structure. As a result of those early discussions, the city council at the time did submit a request to the Army Corps um, to undertake the 1135 feasibility study, and that happened in 2016. Um, I think the city's main interest at that time was really focused on improved water quality and, and fish passage. Uh, those are the, uh, the focus of 1135 funds. But there's always um, uh, interest discuss, discussions and interest in what was the potential for this uh, project to provide the city some economic and recreational benefits as well. Uh, those have been discussed since 2016. Um, so the city remained committed to the project um, with the council, different councils actually voting several times to proceed with the study. These are at critical points in the study. And last year, the council, or the city council created the uh, 1135 advisory committee uh, with the purpose and the goal of keeping the council informed as the study progressed. Um, and to help evaluate potential concerns and benefits um, that the project could bring to the city. And that committee had the opportunity to, um, to end of April, to host a, an open house, a community event open house, and really presented this work um, to the whole community. Um, and, and that was a, uh, an important step. I think one final note from the city's perspective, um, since the project started in 2016, the city has accomplished uh, a really a remarkable amount of work in updating all the infrastructure plans for the city, updating a comprehensive plan, updating parks and transportation plans. And in 2021, um, the city adopted the Riverside, the, the Monroe Riverside District Master Plan that really seeks to revitalize the downtown area um, and to try to reconnect the town to the river. That same year, the mayor also uh, launched an economic development committee um, aimed at improving business opportunities and quality of life in Monroe. So, really, with all of that, the result of all that work and planning and activity and visioning that the city went through, I really believe right now there's a much stronger sense today than in 2016 um, of the river's value and importance to the community and how this project could better connect the community with the river. So I'm really excited to see the study near completion. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for all the work that's gone into it so far. Um, thank you. And yeah, thank you, John. Um, and, and so with that, um, I believe Andrea from the Confederated Tribes of Celeste Indians is also on the line. I'd like to give her an opportunity with any opening remarks. Hello, trying to, there we go. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, glad you could all make it. Uh, to start off, I also just want to echo um, John's thanks for such a an, an, uh, really great group to work with. Um, all the core staff and um, uh, John and Steve in the city of Monroe and especially the um, Dana and Jed and the others with the Long Tom Watershed Council have really made it um, really made it a, a positive experience. Um, so this project has we've been pleased to work with both the city and the core on this and the watershed council on this project as it is um ancestral lands of the Kalapuya people of which descend some of the descendants are members of the confederated tribes of Salets. and it's um an important uh it's an um, finding a, a way to establish this fish, fish passage around um the 
dam at Monroe is important because it does open up more spawning and rearing habitat for um, important first foods like Chinook salmon and lamprey, um, but also just in general uh, restoring uh, aquatic health to the area will hopefully be beneficial to many species, um, not just the ones in, uh, of most importance to the tribe. Um, so we are just excited that we are kind of reaching a milestone and hopefully um, continue to see a uh, good path forward on reaching that goal. And thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Um, so from the Army Corps of Engineers side, as I said, my name is Elliot Porter. Um, I'm the planner on the study. Also joining us this evening is Ben O'Connor. He's the technical lead uh, for this study. Uh, we have Matt Bame, who is uh, who, who works at the Willamette Valley Project, um, and Carrie Solon, who is with our Public Affairs Office. Uh, so we have a couple of people from the core team uh, on the line as well to help answer any questions. Uh, so with that, I am going to jump into the presentation. I'll just provide a really quick background uh, in terms of, you know, how we got to this point. Um, and, and so back in, in the 1940s, you know, the, the Fern Ridge Dam was constructed. Um, the Long Tom River at the time um, was not really able to handle the outflows coming from that dam. And so in 1943, as an add-on to the Fern Ridge project, um, the Corps constructed something called the Long Tom River Channel Rectification and Improvement Project. Um, and, and what we did, if you, know, if you live in the city of Monroe, I'm sure you're very familiar, uh, we straightened the river, uh, we added earthen embankments to each side to keep it in place, and we had three drop structures. Um, and the drop structures' primary purpose are to slow the water down, uh, to reduce the risk of erosion um, or for the water to move outside of the channel um, and, and potentially flood communities. And so, you know, the, the 1135 uh, authorization or authority that we have with the Corps of Engineers allows us to come back uh, after a project is constructed and to look for alternatives to alleviate uh, any ecological degradation that we may have caused by a project uh, and make modifications to it uh, in order to restore some of that habitat. Um, you know, one of the, the main constraints that we have with the Section 1135 project is while we're looking to restore ecosystem, we need to make sure that the original authorized function of the project stays in place. And so when we're looking at alternatives uh, associated with this project, we really needed to make sure that anything that we did was not going to negatively impact the channel uh, to cause, you know, increased erosion or uh, potential failure of the embankments or increased flood risk associated um, with modifications to any of the communities on the Long Tom River. So we really worked within those boundaries to determine how much could we do to restore ecosystem and, and what was the most cost-effective way to do it. So as John mentioned, you know, back in 2016, the city of Monroe sent a letter of re request to the Corps of Engineers. Uh, I believe that we were finally funded in 2020 to go ahead and start executing this study. Uh, and the team has been working on it for the last three years. Um, this is really one of the last steps associated with completing a feasibility study. So in addition to a public comment period, the, the draft document is also undergoing a technical and a policy review at the same time. We'll receive everyone's comments together. Uh, the team will work through those, make modifications to the draft report as, as appropriate, um, and we'll present a final report for approval to our division. Um, and, and so we're really close to the end. Um, I know that, you know, three years sounds like a long time, um, and it is a long time, um, but it's it's good to see that, you know, the team has been able to work through some, some challenging issues associated with this in terms of how we tell the story of the ecosystem restoration that we're hoping to achieve and really making sure that, that you know, we don't cause any unintended impacts associated with modifications to uh, the channel improvement project. 
So what we're looking at here um, on, in the map on the right-hand side is really the extent of the area that we were considering for constructed features. So if we were gonna build something, we really wanted to build it within this yellow area. So on the left-hand side, that's the city of Monroe. Here, um, if you can see my cursor, that line across the Long Tom River, that's the Monroe drop structure. Um, and, and the reason that we limited ourselves to a specific area is we knew that the primary objective was to determine, you know, how do we restore fish passage? How do we reconnect, you know, the three plus miles between the Monroe drop structure and the Strota drop structure? Um, and, you know, one of the big benefits of focusing specifically at the drop structure site is that, you know, to the right on this picture is, is the, the Monroe City Park. Um, and so that is owned by the city um, within the channel. That is within a core flow adjustment. And so we have some latitude in, in terms of the types of things that we can do there. Um, and, and so by focusing specifically on this area, we felt pretty confident that we would be able to identify a project um, that would be implementable, uh, that we wouldn't have to go out and acquire a bunch of real estate, that we wouldn't have to look to acquire private property to implement, um, and it would provide us a lot of benefit by reconnecting that upstream habitat. Um, and so this was really kind of one of our initial considerations um, was to, to keep it to keep it targeted to not necessarily look way upstream and downstream of the drop structure um, in terms of modifications to the embankment or any potential impacts to agricultural land. And so, you know, as the team kind of worked with um, our, our sponsors and the Long Tom Watershed Council. What we determined the objective of this study really was, was to restore or improve fish passage at the mid-road drop structure. And then when we consider these, we, we try to identify some target species. So what are the species that we feel are most important or would, would be a good indicator species to show that we have restored or improved habitat? Uh, and so for this, we're looking at juvenile cutthroat trout, juvenile spring chinook salmon, and Pacific lamprey. Um, and so we say a 50 year period of analysis, anytime the Corps of Engineers looks at a project, we want to consider the long term benefits associated with it. We don't want just an immediate benefit when we come in and construct something. We want to make sure that we have a lasting impact in terms of the modifications that we're making. Um, and so we know that, you know, beyond this, uh, as you move further upstream, there's lots of additional tributaries and streams, um, and, and there's additional uh, potential habitat on the Long Tom River that can potentially be reconnected or improved uh, also to benefit these species. So, you know, in coordination with the Long Tom Watershed Council, um, we know that there are other opportunities to consider bypass alternatives moving upstream to reconnect some of those areas. But really what we needed to do was uh, address this first impediment to fish passage, which is the Monroe drop structure, you know, on the Long Tom River uh, coming up from the Willamette. So it, it really reconnects us um, to, to a large area uh, and has an opportunity to co connect us to a lot of additional upstream area. So, you know, I had mentioned the constraint um, of 1135, which is we need to make sure that any modifications to the Monroe drop structure was not going to impact the risk of flood, and it was not going to impact the ability of the existing project to convey the water out of Fern Ridge. Um, we had an additional constraint in coordination with the city, which is that a recommended plan needed to be compatible with the city of Monroe's water intake structure. So we know that in the pooled area behind the Monroe drop structure, that is where the city's water supply um, is, is pulled from the river. Um, and so understanding that we're looking at modifications that are gonna change the water level uh, that currently exists behind the drop structure, we needed to ensure that prior to making a recommendation, we also had a plan or a strategy in place in terms of how we were gonna ensure continuity and quality of, uh, of the water supply um, into the future after this project was implemented. And so this is just a general overview of how we tried to tackle the problem. Um, so when we looked at our alternatives, and we'll talk about what, you know, some of those were specifically in a couple of slides, 
What we wanted to address first was this reconnection piece. So we wanted to make sure that any alternative that we were putting forward in part or in whole restored upstream connectivity on the Long Tom River. That, that was really what the problem that we were trying to solve. Um, we had also considered some additional measures uh, to restore, you know, what we're calling off-channel habitat. So outside of the, the, the channel that's constrained by the embankment is all of those historic meanders and turns in the river that we straightened out of it. And a lot of them are remnant wetlands now. And so, you know, if you walk through Monroe City Park, the, the depressed areas that have water in them, they used to be part of the original Long Tom River. Now they act as a wetland. And so we wanted to make sure that where possible or if possible, we considered additional features that might be able to reconnect that or provide some additional habitat benefit. Uh, but at the end of the day, our main focus was how do we get fish around the drop structure? And so I know that this is a really big slide. Uh, these are going to be posted on the public notice website. Uh, as, uh, along with a recording of this public meeting for those who couldn't join us today. And so if I move through a little bit quickly um, and you maybe don't get to look through it as closely as you'd like, uh, one, it's, it's, it's in the report, um, in the draft report, and it will be posted to the public notice site. Um, but on the left, is the list of the, the alternatives that we considered as a part of this study. Um, and so the removal of the drop structure, um, a rock ramp at the drop structure, and so that would be, you know, building out um, basically a ramp made out of stone that fish would be able to swim up and get over the drop structure. Um, we also considered some various bypass channels um, of different lengths, and so that would be uh, breaching the embankment to allow water to flow back into the historic meander. Um, and, you know, that way we could potentially leave the dam in place um, and still get some benefit from moving fish upstream. So we looked at a couple of different iterations of that. So, you know, uh, in discussion with our fish biologists and some of the resource agencies, um, we got some feedback in terms of what a short bypass channel would look like. So um, breaching the embankment just up and downstream of uh, the drop structure um, to longer bypass channels that would reconnect more of the historic meander, more of the, the existing wetland areas, uh, and maybe create some additional uh, habitat. And then we looked at combinations of those types of measures and how they would work together uh, to determine what we felt was the best and most cost-effective solution. So I'm going to call out this ID column here. Um, I know that they're not very intuitive, but we have a couple of maps that are showing comparisons. And, and so if you want to reference between them, um, if you go back and look at the PowerPoint presentation, you'll, you'll see these letterings um, for, for ID, um, and that will indicate which of those alternatives the map is showing. And so the, the big question that we needed to answer was if we if we make modifications to the drop structure, how does that improve habitat conditions? And so um, this is like a really busy slide, I know, but it was a pretty complex question, and, and I wanted to make sure that we did address it uh, to a certain extent. But we use something called habitat suitability indices or habitat uh, suitability curves. And, and what those are, are they are model outputs that tell us what do ideal conditions look like for our target species. So we had talked about the Chinook, the cutthroat trout, uh, and the Pacific lamprey. Those were the ones that we were considering specifically. And what the team determined um, was that what we really needed to be concerned with was water depth and water velocity, or the speed that the water is moving through the channel. Um, and so that's really what we focused on in terms of our modeling. And what you'll see is, um, in the upper left-hand corner with the lowercase a, that's, um, I believe that's our current condition. So the existing drop structure is there, um, and this is kind of what it looks like now from a habitat suitability standpoint. Um, the, the yellows and the lighter oranges, that's less suitable habitat. As you move towards red, that's more suitable habitat. Um, and we ran that at some different flow scenarios. So we know that the water levels 
are not always the same. So we had a low, a medium, and a high flow condition that we considered. Um, and so, you know, as we looked at each of these alternatives, we modeled them um, and we compared them against our baseline to figure out how we were improving the habitat and how much we were improving the habitat. Um, and, and so, you know, what you can see here as you move across the top is what some of those various bypass channels look like. And, and these are, this is really just a snapshot of the area around the Monroe drop structure. This was modeled all the way up to Strota because we know that in, in reconnection uh, or in reconnecting habitat, we are really kind of reclaiming everything that's above the drop structure that's currently uh, blocking fish passage moving upstream. And so this is just a small area uh, in terms of the larger uh, area that we considered in terms of benefits. But I think it gives you a good idea of, you know, where would some of that water flow when we say bypass and, you know, how might that impact the park? Um, and, you know, why would we consider that? And, and I think, you know, if you look at some of these bypass channels, you see a lot of red um, because that is suitable habitat uh, for, for the types of species that we're considering. And so again, uh, another busy slide, but what's really important to take away is that it, we're looking at ecosystem restoration. So there's no one right answer. We can't say, you know, the, the when we look at costs and we look at benefits that this is, you know, the one that is most effective and most efficient. Um, and so we have to do a little bit of consideration of, you know, how much is additional habitat worth to us? How much is that additional investment each time we add some, some piece to the, uh, to the alternative that we're looking to propose? And so I'll give a little bit of an explainer on the chart to the right. So we took those 10 alternatives that were in the big table a couple of slides ago. We ran them through an economic model that said, hey, these three alternatives are the ones that are gonna give you the most bang for your buck. Um, and so what we ended up with was total removal, um, total removal in the short bypass and total removal with a long bypass. So if you'll notice from a cost effectiveness standpoint, removal of the drop structure in every instance was considered critical to having a successful project. And so when you look at this green bar here at the bottom, what that is telling us is that we can restore 43 acres of additional habitat with our project when we remove the drop structure. Um, and so that's a, that's a lot of habitat benefit that we're looking at. Um, the bar is so short because the cost associated with that is relatively low. And so for, the, the, for those 43 acres that we would gain with removal of the drop structure, the cost associated with that would be an average annual cost of $1,900 per acre. Um, and so having worked on some of these studies in the core, um, you know, that's a very cost effective um, solution to the problem that we were looking at. We get a lot of environmental benefits. The cost is relatively low with total removal of the drop structure. We don't let this necessarily leave a lot of operations and maintenance associated with the project moving forward. And in fact, from the core perspective, we potentially decrease some of our ongoing operations and maintenance costs because we no longer have to maintain that drop structure anymore. Now, as we move up to this blue box, that's what happens when we add in the short bypass. So we would remove the drop structure, we would breach the embankment and create some additional side channel wetland habitat. Um, and so the box is higher. Um, we would get, I believe, an additional six acres of habitat benefit, but each of those six acres would cost us $20,000 as opposed to $1,900. And then finally, when we look at the long bypass, um, which, is, which is breaching the embankment much further downstream and reconnecting a lot of that historic meander, um, we would get one additional acre of habitat benefit and that one additional acre would cost us about $198,000. And so, you know, the, the, the Corps of Engineers team met with the city, we met with the, uh, with the select uh, and the watershed council, and we kind of discussed through these alternatives. And the decision that we have to make isn't necessarily, do we grab the most environmental benefits, but what really makes sense in this instance? Um, 
And so, you know, we made the recommendation that we would just do the first increment. So we would remove the drop structure. And so when we started to consider the, the bigger picture or maybe the additional impact associated with the removal of the drop structure, we fleshed out our recommended plan a little bit. And I'll walk through each of the features here. Um, the first, obviously the removal of the drop structure is the primary feature that we're looking to construct. Um, so when they say removal of the drop structure, that will be specifically the dam area. We'll be leaving the head race, the historic fish ladder, um, and the head wall structure in place. And so those are the features, um, you know, the historically may have been part of the original mill dam, uh, have been in place for a while and are part of the cultural heritage of the city of Monroe. Um, those will be left in place. Those will not be removed. Um, everything else will um, to allow for uh, more natural flow within, within the river. Um, so once we remove that, we have some sediment that is sitting behind it, and we have kind of a, a riverbed that has realigned itself um, because that structure has been in place for 70 years. Um, so when we remove that structure, we know that there's going to be uh, sediment, some sediment behind there. We know that there might be some holes in the river um, or, or other things that we might need to, um, to smooth out. So as a part of that, you know, we considered removal of some of the sediments or regrading of some of them. And, and what that means is kind of spreading them out, using them to fill in those holes um, and, and trying to restore a little bit of a more natural stream bed environment that would be beneficial to our target species. Now, uh, as we move upstream, uh, Highway 99, the bridge piers are right now in an area that's pulled by the Monroe drop structure. So the water does not move very fast past the Highway 99 bridge. Um, and so we determined with the increased velocities, we needed to ensure that we weren't creating any, um, any safety hazard. Uh, and so as a part of this project, we are recommending erosion protection around those piers. Um, and called riprap. It's just big rocks that we put around it. Um, I'm sure you've seen it all along the channel. Uh, it's used to basically keep things in, in place and to minimize the scour and erosion that might happen when you have fast flowing water moving past something. And so this is also incorporated into the project. Now, um, if you looked at some of the other alternatives, you can see that that, that off-channel habitat or the habitat that was identified in the bypass channels was all dark red. So that was, that was excellent habitat for the target species that we were considering. And so while we chose not to move forward with the implementation of the bypasses, in addition to the total removal of the drop structure, what we did consider was the replacement of the culvert that currently exists in the embankment at River Mile 6.6. Um, and so right now there's a 30 inch pipe. Uh, we're gonna expand that to 42 inches. So we're gonna make it larger um, and we're going to add what's called an engineered riffle structure. And, and basically it's a series of stepped concrete pools that, are, that we believe will allow um, fish to access the, the wetland area during periods of moderate and high flows um, that, are, that are most common uh, in, the, in the winter and the spring. Um, when we might have our target species present. And so we think that we can still capture some of that off-channel benefit without necessarily adding all of that additional cost um, and then having to do uh, some of the additional work associated with making sure that uh, we don't erode the banks of that bypass channel and, and impact any of the city amenities that are over there, such as the baseball field. And so this is the recommendation that the team um, and the city and the tribe believe reasonably maximizes our environmental benefits in a cost-effective manner. Um, the estimated cost of this study for or this project for implementation will be approximately $2.4 million. Um, the Corps of Engineers cost shares these projects until under Section 1135, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers would pay 75% of that total cost and the non-federal sponsors um, in this instance, the city of Monroe would pay 25% of that. And so this is a, more of a visual representation of, of what we're talking about. 
And so if we can focus up here first. Um, this is the area where the drop structure is. Um, and so this would be the removal feature. Um, when we look upstream, this is the highway 99, this is the highway 99 bridge. And you can see we have this inset down here. Those are the six bridge piers that we would be looking to um, provide scour protection from with riprap armoring. And then downstream, this is where the culvert is in relation to the drop structure. Um, and I mentioned the engineered stepped pool structure that we would install. This is kind of what it looks like. It's linear. Um, it has, you know, these individual pooled areas for the, for the fish to access uh, the culvert and to get into the wetland uh, area here um, back in the Monroe City Park. And so, you know, these were our other considerations when we were making a selection. Um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, all alternatives um, were, were, were considered during, you know, a 1% flow exceedance, what we used to call a 100-year event, to ensure that there was no risk or no increase to the, the relative flood risk uh, with any modifications that we were making at the project site. The second big consideration was to make sure that we were not increasing erosion. Um, and a lot of that was primarily focused at the Highway 99 bridge. Um, and again, we included features that mitigated for that. And then finally, we do still have an existing core project uh, in the Long Tom Channel. And we wanted to make sure that any modifications we made were not going to increase or significantly increase our ongoing operations and maintenance of that channel. Um, and so we worked through that process. Um, we know that there is, you know, some existing scour and erosion that happens on an annual basis. We would not anticipate to see a significant increase um, uh, of that. And, and we're really looking at uh, about a mile and a half section um, where right now the Monroe drop structure is holding that water and it would go to flowing a, a little bit faster, uh, moving through there in a little bit of a more natural state. Um, and so, you know, again on the right, um, these are the various alternatives and maybe where, where some of the water would go and what some of those would look like um, during high flow events, I believe. Um, so you can see here that uh, particularly when we were looking at some of these bypass channels, you know, we definitely had a consideration, right, for how that would impact the city park, and we wanted to make sure that we wouldn't do anything that would minimize or negatively affect the community's usage of that park. And so that's the kind of the basis of the recommendation, our analysis, uh, some of the key considerations that went into it and how we arrived at our conclusions. Um, I, I believe that this is my last slide before we move into questions. I wanted to provide just a little bit of a timeline in terms of where we're at and where we're going. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the public comment period will close on June 30th. Um, today is a great opportunity to provide any comments if you have them. The next slide will show all of the ways that you can get in touch with us. Um, if you get stuck or you can't remember or you don't have access to this, please reach out to City Hall. They have all of this information, and as I mentioned, they'll be collecting any comments or questions to pass on to us. Um, we have a technical and a policy review that are ongoing. Did have a check-in on that today, and, and we're proceeding forward and, and hoping to have that wrapped up in a similar timeline to the, to the public comment period at the, at the end of June. Uh, and then we're targeting an approval of our feasibility study and our recommendation by September of 2023, so this year. Um, and so when we transition into design and construction, it's a little bit tougher for us to put dates on it. Um, so as we talked about it at the beginning of the presentation, the uh, city of Monroe sent an initial letter of intent to the Corps of Engineers to work on this project, and it, it took, um, about six years to get funding uh, assigned to it. So we're in, we're in it now, um, and, and the line is definitely shorter. However, uh, funding decisions for design and construction of these projects are made annually, um, and they are joint decisions by our headquarters, Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, congressional budget committees. And so they take all of the, um, the 
completed projects that are eligible for funding and that have sponsors that are ready to move forward, and they make a determination that they can afford X number um, of, of studies to move into construction in a given year. Um, and so it's really difficult to say, you know, even if we complete in September of 2023, which is the end of the, the federal fiscal year, um, that we would be uh, given funding in October of, or November of the next year. Uh, it may be an additional year from there. It may be two additional years. Um, obviously, we will continue to advocate uh, for the construction of this project. As I mentioned before, it's pretty affordable, and so we're hopeful that we can make a really strong case um, to move into design and construction. Um, but some of those decisions are, are out of our hands, and the best that we can do is put forward a good defense um, or a um, good promotion of our project uh, to, encourage, um, to encourage it to be funded. So once we do receive funding, we'll negotiate and execute what we call a project partnership agreement. Um, we executed one for the feasibility study, um, and so it's a similar agreement that outlines everyone's responsibilities in getting us to project completion and what that looks like moving forward. Um, once we've done those two things, our construction timeline is estimated to be 18 to 24 months, and that includes the design period. And the reason why it's pretty long, even though the project looks relatively straightforward, is there's only so many months in the year um, that we're able to do construction in the water without impacting the environment. And, and so uh, we have pretty limited windows associated with that. So if we get funding uh, at a specific time or we complete design at a specific time, we may have a wait of you know, nine months to a year uh, before we're actually able to get in the water and do construction to make sure that we're not doing any unnecessary harm uh, while we're trying to implement our ecosystem restoration project. Um, and then after that's complete, the project will be turned over to the city of Monroe. Um, and, and so I had mentioned earlier about some of our real estate considerations. Once we complete these projects, you know, the project sponsor owns them moving forward. With this, there's not a ton that's in place. Um, I had mentioned the culvert. That will remain Corps of Engineers property. That is part of our, our uh, Long Tom Channel improvement project. Um, and so the Corps will, will maintain operation of that moving into the future. Um, and then the, the city and the Corps of Engineers will jointly monitor the project for up to five years to make sure it functions in, as planned. So we want to make sure that the fish are coming back. We want to make sure that our, you know, our, um, our, our stepped pool structure is functioning um, and that the fish are, are, are hopefully using it and they're accessing the wetland. Uh, and we do have some flexibility to come in and make some minor modifications uh, in order to make sure that we're achieving the benefits uh, that we hoped to achieve with this project. Um, and so after that five-year period, uh, we will wrap it up. It will be fully owned by the city of Monroe and hopefully it will be integrated into your community by then. Um, and so, you know, while I'm not able to provide specific dates, I, I hope that this at least provides a general timeline uh, in terms of what implementation might look like. And then finally, um, how to submit comments. So there is a QR code on the screen. Um, so for those of you who have not seen the feasibility study yet, um, uh, the QR code will directly link you to that. So if you open your phone camera and you hold it up, you'll see a little link pop up. You can click that and it will take you to the Corps of Engineers website where all of the documents are housed. Um, so as I mentioned, you can submit comments in person at the Monroe City Hall. Um, we have an email inbox that's set up specifically for this project. You can email us any of your comments. If you would prefer to mail us comments, here is the address of where you can reach us and how you can, uh, how you can address uh, the letter. Uh, and then at the bottom of the page, this is where our draft feasibility study is. So if you have an interest in looking at the complete document um, and you haven't had an opportunity to do so, this contains the public announcement. Um, it had all of the links to the meeting this evening. Um, and it also includes links to all of the documents associated with this project. And so with that, I really reserve the rest of the time uh, to answer questions, to get your feedback. Uh, but first, I'll, I'll just turn it over uh, to John if he has any additional comments after the presentation.
Um, yeah, not not at this not at this moment. Um, I'm, I'm available to, to try to answer any questions that would come up, um, and uh, or take take people's names and, and follow up if I need to. Um, and we have other people standing by to answer uh, questions as well. So thank you. Thanks, John. I so um, I I think I saw a question pop up in the chat and I think I saw someone's hand raised. So if we can start with the um, chat question, I believe Carrie, are are you on? Are you able to read that? Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. I don't know if it was sent directly to you because I'm not seeing it. Okay. Um, then we'll start with the hand raise and I'll see if I can I can uh, find the question in the chat. Uh, yeah, this is Alex Farron with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, thanks for the presentation. Good information. Um, I just wanted to make sure um, that uh, going forward that the state gets consulted on this, uh, specifically regarding the fish passage um, requirements and criteria, and that they um, uh, that they obtain fish passage approvals. It looks to me that there's going to be at least two fish passage approvals required, one for the structural removal of the drop structure and then one for the culvert replacement. Um, and so I don't know if that's been discussed or concerned, but that's that's going to be needed. So the sooner the better on that. Um, and then I guess I just had a question about the, um, the old ladder. Um, uh, I guess it's not being removed. And I'm just curious as to why it's being left. I guess it may be for historical reasons, but it just seems like it's, I'm not sure why there's a piece of concrete that's going to be just sitting there um, that needs to be saved. If you could comment on that a little bit. Yeah, th thanks for the questions, Alex. Um, and so for the for the fish passage approval, we're you know we're still in the um, the NEPA process. So as a as a part of this public scoping meeting, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, this um, public information session, we had also reached out to the the various state and federal resource agencies to provide initial comments on the plan. Um, I, I believe that that is likely something. Um, that would happen during design and implementation when we're further progressed on plans and specs, uh, when we would be reaching out to get um, our various permits, uh, our various permit requirements met once the, um, once the plan has progressed further. Uh, and then in terms of leaving the, um, the historic fish ladder in place, uh, it didn't really have an impact uh, necessarily to the fish passage question. And in consultation with the city, I believe it is eligible for listing on the historic register uh, in excess of 50 years old. Um, and it was something that was identified as part of the, the cultural history of the community. And, and so um, as it didn't necessarily provide an impediment um, and it was something that was considered important to the community, there was no reason for us to remove it over. And real quick, this is Matt with Army Corps. The other piece to that, Alex, is that is actually privately owned, that fish ladder. So the, the Corps does not own that fish ladder. Yeah, thank Thanks. you, Matt. Um, and then I, I do have a question in the chat. Um, it is, uh, are there any plans to replace the Highway 99 bridge? It's narrow makes a sharp curve and is not seismically reinforced. Also, the footings do not appear compatible with moving water. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, that is outside of the scope of, of what we could address as a part of this project. Um, and so the bridge is owned by ODOT. Uh, we have had some coordination with ODOT um, on the bridge and the modifications that we're considering. And so, you know, while we're, we're in agreement that the footings as they exist, um, if we did not come in and mitigate for the increased velocities might create some sort of risk, 
uh, we believe that we have adequately addressed the risk by adding the riprap armoring around the bridge piers. Um, and so I, I don't have any comments specifically on what the timeline for uh, replacement or rehabilitation of that bridge might be from the ODOT perspective. And it's unfortunately not something that we can uh, directly control or address from the Corps of Engineers. Hi, I have a question. I, sorry, go ahead. Um, so I just love this presentation and I'm so happy for all the collaboration with the Confederated Tribes and the Longcom Watershed Council. I'm a local volunteer on the Fire Whites Committee and I've been talking to our fire chief about the possibility that this project would add what he calls pump chances, which is the opportunity in the event of a large fire such as a wildfire for the uh, uh, fire um, tankers to pull water out of the long tom at a number of locations. Could you explain that and, and, and confirm that that is part of this project? Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm not very familiar with that and it was not a direct uh, planning consideration as a part of our project. Um, I will throw it over to Matt or John if they have anything to add to that to that response. I, I don't know specifically on the, the Firewise piece. I'm familiar with that program, but um, not specific to this part of the long time, but I am I'm happy to look into that a little more for you. And I'm happy to leave my contact info if you want to reach out about that, but uh, I don't have anything off uh, offhand right now. Great, thank you. Uh, this is John, um, and I just want to, that is, there are uh, aspects of the project um, that are addressed by the Army Corps, and we've all often been discussing other attributes uh, that are of value to the city and working with the Long Tom Watershed Council in, a, in a, making sure we can attain some of those. And the, um, the dry wells are definitely um, <clears throat> part of the, uh, the attributes outside the Army Corps work that are um, we working on trying to design and make sure they're included um, as well. And, and that final design, I think, would, ha would have to happen once the project uh, moves forward. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, so we have another uh, question in the chat, and uh, it's any considerations for the safety hazards associated with the existing drop structures, or are we just concerned with fish passage? Um, and, and so I'll answer part of that, and then I'll kick it over to Matt. Um, within the scope of this study, our primary objective was to restore fish passage. Uh, we did consider safety considerations associated with it, um, and, and so understanding that a removal of the drop structure uh, would naturally improve safety conditions on the Long Tom River. Uh, and so we did, we did consider that, we did account for it when we were comparing our alternatives. Um, and it is, I think, uh, at least in part, uh, a reason why um, total removal of the drop structure is our recommendation today. Um, and so just in terms of the, the general safety hazards associated with the drop structures, Matt, is there anything that, that you're able to add there? Yeah, to, to kind of build on what Elliot said there, um, we're, we're definitely aware of the safety issues. And so we just did work with um, the Oregon State Marine Board to put up signs at the the two remaining drop structures well and, and actually the, the monroe drop structure as well um which you know if this project goes through we'll be able to take those sides down but um if any of the folks have been out there in in monroe they're large red signs to really um they go back a thousand feet from um, the drop structures and so really working and we worked with like i said the oregon state marine board to design those to be visible from from the water um, and so to give folks that heads up that those things are coming and signs even telling them when to you know pull out of the water and stuff and so we we are aware of that and safety was definitely um, a consideration and, and we are thinking about that um, like elliot said that you know the focus was on fish passage but safety was definitely something that we considered thanks Matt. 
So I, I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat. Is there anyone on the line um, that wants to come off mute and ask a question? Dana, I'm seeing a raised hand. Hi, this is Dana from the Long Tom Watershed Council. And I just wanted to uh, chime in with thankfulness to all the partners. But also there was a mention of the 25% cost share to the non federal sponsor, um, which would be the city of Monroe. And that is um, partially the role of the nonprofit partner, the long Tom watershed council in helping to raise those funds and get the grants that will provide that cost share match. And also to work with the city for those um, non core components of the project, like those dry wells, um, reaching out to help the agricultural community, the few folks with uh, irrigation diversions that might need new screens, fish screens, um, all kinds of things. We'll be working on the city water intake, uh, making sure that is rebuilt in a way that works really well with the water flow. Um, if the project moves forward, so just letting folks on the call know that the long time watershed council uh, will remain a partner to the project um, in the interest of all the partners. Should add to uh, that. Thanks very much, I should probably add to that to just down the road this is just something to consider because not that many people know about it, it seems is that um, the state does have funding as well um, for fish passage projects such as these. Um, and it, you know, it's a bit of a competitive process, but there's, you know, um, as far as I know, um, a couple million dollars every year. Um, so, um, just something to consider. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Um, I believe I have another question in the chat. Are you cooperating with the city of Monroe on the opportunity to improve city access to the city park? They are in discussions, I understand, with a private party to use existing structure abutments for pedestrian uh, bridge, uh, bicycle bridge. Um, so uh, that's a really good question. Um, the, the, the focus of the study and the limitations of our authority don't really allow us to address the recreation questions. But when we were developing the alternatives and particularly when we got to a selection of the alternative, we worked with the city planning council um, and, and John in particular to ensure that any modifications that we were looking to make um, would not impede or negatively impact the city's waterfront master plan. Uh, and so all of the features included in that are features that can still be constructed even after the completion of our project. Um, but unfortunately, the Corps of Engineers is not able to consider those features or, in, or incorporate them into our recommendation as a part of a cost shared project. Andrea, I see you have a hand raised. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to, um, follow up on, uh, I had to step out for a little while, but I wanted to reiterate, even though um, plus, uh, Confederated Tribes of Solettes may not move forward as a co-sponsor for the construction phase due to various reasons, we are still strongly supportive of the project and um, we continue to um, support and, and assist in any other way we could. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Um, and, and so I am not seeing any other hand raised or chat comments. Uh, I'll just pause for, for a minute to see if there is kind of any last minute questions that anyone would like to ask while we're all on the line. Well, I, this is John again, and I might quick jump in about the, the, the comment about the bridge and um, and yes, that 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 I that need and wish have, have been on uh, been of interest to the city for for a long time, and um, there are opportunities that that we are continuing to look at for creating a safe way to get from the city to the city park. Um, again, that's outside of this project, but with the work going on, there may be some opportunities to um, um, you know get some of the design 
uh, considerations on board before, while the work is going on and, and get some co uh, cooperation there. But that is uh, would be a city um, or, or a private group working to attain that bridge uh, outside of the, the Army Corps work. Um, but it certainly is on everybody's mind and could be a real benefit to the community. Yeah, so um, I, I just want to thank everyone again for taking time out of your evening uh, to listen to the presentation and, and to ask your questions. Um, this presentation has been recorded. Um, it will be posted on the public notice site um, in addition to all of the ways that you can reach out to us and the presentation. Uh, and so if you're talking to anyone and they have an interest in the project, they weren't available this evening um, to, to join us live. I, I strongly encourage you to direct them uh, towards these resources. Um, and if they have any questions or comments, to please reach out to us. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up for the evening. Thanks very much to, to everyone who joined us and, and thank you for your engagement. Good night.